Uh, good afternoon, members, and welcome to this afternoon's meeting of the Northern Ireland Assembly Public Accounts Committee. We are now in open session, and we have quorum. So, m members, can I, in welcoming you to today's meeting, uh, point out that phones must be set to airplane mode or turned off. It is not sufficient to put mobiles on silent as they continue to interfere with the Assembly recording. The session is being recorded on video and audio and can be accessed via the online streaming and the Assembly website for Democracy Live. Uh, members, as you will know from the proceedings of the House on Monday uh, afternoon, sadly last weekend we lost one of our valued and esteemed colleagues, Christopher Stolford, MLA, the Principal Deputy Speaker of this Assembly. Uh, today I'd like to uh, take a minute's silence to mark uh, his passing and to remember him and his family, his wife Laura, their four children uh, at this time. Would you please be upstanding? <coughs> Thank you. Okay, members, then agenda item one is apologies and declaration, uh, sorry, delegation of votes. Um, have we any apologies today other than Mr. Hilditch? Yes, Mr. Hilditch. No delegation of votes. Okay, so agenda item two then is the minutes of the 17th of February 2022, which are in your pack, pages seven through to 11. Are members content? I have your permission to sign this being a true and record accu uh, accurate minute of the meeting. Read. Read. Okay. Thank you. Um, Agenda item three then is declarations of interest. Members at each meeting, you're required to register relevant financial or other interests um, uh, in terms of the members' declaration of interest. Today's meeting matters include the planning in Northern Ireland, broad plan investment, and the Northern Ireland budget process. Does any member have any interest they wish to declare this afternoon? Agreed? Okay, matters arising. Are there any matters arising, members? Okay, and then agenda item five is correspondence. At pages 21 to 28 of your pack, um, uh, you will see the correspondence. And at this stage, I would like to just welcome Mr. Kieran Donnelly, CB, the Controller and Auditor General from the Northern Ireland Audit Office, Ms. Colette Kane, uh, Director, and Mr. Kyle Bingham, the Assembly Support Officer, who's joining us remotely. Good afternoon, everyone. You're very welcome. Uh, members, I refer to correspondence dated the 18th to 22nd of February in your packs, pages 21 to 23, and your table pack, pages 3 to 4, from Mr. Mike Keeley regarding a broadband investment inquiry. Mr. Keeley has provided some interesting information which will be included in the uh, report's appendices. I note that we've also seen, uh, have first consideration of the report into broadband investment in Northern Ireland later on today. Are you content to forward Mr. Keeley's correspondence to the Northern Ireland Audit Office? Agreed. Agreed. Thank you. Uh, I referred to correspondence dated the 14th of February 2022 from Mr. Edward Cook, pages 24 through to 28 of your pack, regarding the quality monitoring of Northern Ireland governmental uh, de departmental spending programmes. Uh, are you content that we forward this on to the Northern Ireland Audit Office? Agreed. Okay. Uh, members, we will continue in open session to hear further evidence on our inquiry planning in Northern Ireland. Today we have rep <coughs> excuse me, represent <coughs> excuse me, representatives from Nilga uh, with us, Councillor Stephen Core, Councillor Robert Irvine, and Miss Karen Smith from Nilga. 
Uh, NILGA are the Northern Ireland Local Government Association. Uh, so we will move to agenda item six, then, is inquiry into planning in Northern Ireland evidence session, pages 30 to 108 of your pack. Um, and as I've said, we will join by representatives of NILGA, and Mr. Donnelly will be attending the meeting, and remotely, Mr. Stuart Stevenson, the TOA, should be joining us. Mr. Stevenson, are you there? Uh, good afternoon. You're very welcome. So, members, if I can refer then to the papers in your pack, uh, suggest questioning 30 and 31. Uh, NILGA background information, pages 32. A Northern Ireland Audit Office report planning in Northern Ireland, pages 33 to 108 of your pack. Uh, the Public Accounts Committee uh, welcome NILGA to the uh, committee today. And I, at this stage, would welcome uh, Councillor Stephen Corr, Councillor Robert Irvine, and Ms. Karen Smith. Uh, to the meeting, and uh, at this stage, I would ask uh, so whoever uh, is going to be the initial spokesperson from Milga to make opening comments, and then members will ask questions. Okay, thank you, thank you, <coughs> Mr. Chairman. I'd like to thank the committee for inviting Milga to give evidence this afternoon on what is a very important matter for our article governments. Milga welcomes the audit office report on planning here, and has shown a light on the planning system as it currently operates. As chair of the Milga Planning Infrastructure Network which brings together members and officers from 11 different council areas on a cross-party basis. I would like to reassure the committee that councillors across those 11 districts are working hard to ensure planning is a successful local government-led service experienced positively across the region by all partners within the system. I understand that you have had detailed conversations with our officer colleagues on how improvements could be made and the areas of work where we are experienced buyers. I look forward to our discussion today, and I hope that we can add value from an elected member perspective. From, from your conversations with Salvas last week, we have, we have teased out a few issues that you may want to discuss with us, and hopefully these tally with the committee's intent for today. First of all, I would like to highlight the, to the committee sorry, that, that NILGA was not approached by the Audit Office to participate in the whole system audit of planning. While it may largely make sense to focus on the operational delivery of the service, it is unclear from the report whether any elected members were approached to participate or give views. NOGA believes that this potential omission of the system decision makers from contributing to the Audit Office research and report is a gap that perhaps we can assist in addressing here today. Secondly, I want to put to bed any concerns about perceived undue influence on councillors and potential corruption. All councillors are required to adhere to, a code, to the Code of Conduct for councillors, which, although we are keen to see revised and updated, provides an extremely thorough foundation for members on ethics, planning and conduct. We have had a look at the information provided by the Local Government Commissioner for Standards on our website. Since 2016, there have only been 23 adjudications on complaints against councillors, two of which, only two of which related to planning. These two people are no longer councillors. The Commissioner's Office receives around 50 to 60 complaints per year against councillors. The majority of complaints are closed at the assessment or investigation stage, with no evidence or breach of the code. In 2018-19, 62 complaints were received, and there were only 32 ongoing uh, investigations from the previous year. Only three of these complaints were in relation to planning issues. With an, with an additional one complaint in relation to lobbying and access. Nilga is confident that the concerns of county <coughs> misconduct are largely perception rather than reality, but we ensure in each local government mandate that all 462 councillors are provided with relevant information on ethics and conduct, and that training is made available to ensure continuity on good practice. My colleague, Councillor Irvine, will expand on this shortly. Nilga is of the view that there was a widespread lack of confidence in councils and elected members preceding transfer of planning to councils. This issue has diminished, but the ongoing impact can be seen in the over overweening and control exerted by the Department for Infrastructure and Council planning activities. We understand that the Department was responding to unfounded fears at the time of the transfer, but the unnecessary checks and balances put in place in 2015 are now outdated, and they do negatively, negatively impact upon economic development across the North. The old hierarchy of the Department dictating to local government is an unnecessary barrier to the development of a modern, effective and efficient planning system. It is clear that a key, key requirement moving forward is for central and local government to, to, to be equal partners, and we and local government look forward to the co-design of the changes that we need here. Revised legislation is urgently required and must, take a key prior, must be a key priority of the incoming Assembly mandate if the forthcoming programme for government and government strategies are to deliver for our citizens. Um, with your indulgence, that now to bring in my colleague, Councillor Robert Irvine, to touch on a number of other issues. From here, gentlemen. Yes, indeed. Yep. Good afternoon, and thank you for the invitation to meet with you today. 
I am a member and former chair of the Fermanagh Noma District Council Planning Committee and have been materially involved for some time in working with NILGA to develop their member training offer to elected members. Acting as an elected member mentor on the ILM accredited planning programme for elected members that they have developed. This substantive programme has been very well received across local government and it has been common practice for the planning committee chairs to participate, resulting in them receiving an ILM qualification. The participating members engage with academics and planning professionals and visit a council in GB to garner experience from a similar planning system elsewhere. Assessment is by coursework <coughs> rather than exam. NILGA also provides focus training on ethics and the code of conduct, which was particularly popular with incoming members at the start of the 2019 mandate, and complements the councillor's guide, which is provided to all elected members at the start of each mandate. NILGA strongly believes, and this is borne out across local government in other jurisdictions, that any council that is serious about involving the social economic and environmental well-being of their communities must be committed to developing its councillors. In an effort to develop a consistent approach across councils, NILGA has taken responsibility in Northern Ireland for assessing and awarding the Councillor Development Charter, which provides a robust, structured framework designed to help councils enhance and embed councillor developments in councils. Nine councils have achieved the Charter to date, of which four have successfully achieved the Advanced Charter Plus standard. The remaining two councils are actively in the process of working towards the award. NILGA works closely with sister LGAs and other jurisdictions to ensure high quality of the Charter awards is maintained and consistent across the UK. Once awarded, the Charter has a lifespan of three years after which a council would be required to submit details of how it has sustained the standard. The council is then reassessed against the charter. An informal review after 18 months is also carried out to check progress and identify any needs. Each council assesses its own training needs so that there will be variations between councils, but we have confidence that the framework provided by the charter is assisting our councils to improve planning practice locally on a regionally consistent basis. That variation between councils is also evident in the different approaches to schemes of delegation and decision making. I'm aware that particular note has been taken of the variation between councils in relation to a number of overturns of officer recommendations, but I would counter, counter concerns about this by suggesting that this is a sign of a healthy, functioning planning system where those overturns are in line with the rules. As local development plans reach fruition, this issue will lessen in frequency as a planning policy members will be dealing with, they have been, will have developed and will be more appropriate to local needs. NILGA fully supports the ability of each individual council to develop a locally appropriate approach to planning, within the bounds set by legislation, policy, guidance and the code of conduct. Each council planning committee will have agreed a scheme of delegation locally with their planning officer, and these are kept under review, as is the planning committee protocol in each council, based on a model protocol provided by the department. Finally, I noted with interest the discussions the committee had with Solis last week about the planning forum and the former ministerial planning forum. NILGA and elected members from council do not have a place on the current planning forum, which is an operational officer forum, including officials from across central government and three planning officers from council. We support the idea that membership of the planning forum should be extended to include representatives from the development industry. Applicants and agents must have a voice on such a forum, as we are all in this system together, and I believe that the only way we will resolve the issue is by working together. The suggestion has been made within local government that it might be helpful to rebadge this forum <coughs> as a regional planning commission or similar, 
with the aim of creating something new rather than revamping the existing planning forum. We would also welcome a visit of a revisiting of the former ministerial planning forum, which brought together the minister and the chairs of the 11 planning uh, committees, enabling a central local political discussion focused on planning. We believe that this could complement and add value to the work of the political partnership panel and allow more space at the partnership panel for consideration of a central local approach to other vitally important cross-cutting issues. We wish the committee well in its deliberations and trust that members will agree with us when we express our strongly held view that in redesigning the system, it must be about outcomes and delivery, removing any tendency resulting in failure demand, navel-gazing or being fastidious about the process. Thank you, Chair. We welcome the opportunity to discuss the report with you and are happy to try to <coughs> answer as many of your questions as we can today. OK, thank you. Uh, the issue about the audit office not speaking to Nilga we'll raise later. Um, in terms of uh, <clears throat> the, the issues that, you, that you've raised in, your, raised in your presentations today, um, can I just ask, um, the report does show an incredibly high level of overturns in some councils. How can this be justified? Robert? Uh, well, I'll take that first of all. Maybe Councillor Corr will come after me. When the process was delivered back to councils, we had overarching SPPS and all the PPSs and the regional planning strategy. But the sentiment coming out of that devolution of power back to local government was that people in the locality should have the ability to actually tailor the policies to particular need in the local area. We in Fermanagh and Oma District Council, along with several other councils, I see Melissa from Derry City and Straban actually, and, and Roy from Mid and East Antrim, have a large portion of our area in a rural uh, connection. People who actually work in the area want to live and work in the area. And because of that, we have a high proportion of applications for dwellings in the countryside. Now, the aspiration was that the SPPS would be the document, the framework that we would work to, not that it would be the document that would tell us what to do in each of the 11 areas. We were given the ability to interpret, and that is what we do actually in our local area. And I am quite proud and actually will be an advocate of calling in officer recommendations for a committee discuss so that they can actually bring in items of material interest that possibly the officers have not given enough weight to. And that is what the committee forum is all about. It's about actually scrutinising, interrogating and arriving at a decision that is locally based, not say, in a strict framework. What would you say, Councillor Irvin, to someone who would say that what you describe as interpret is actually helping to create the logjam here? Uh, well, I would disagree with that. Are we trying to process for the sake of processing? Or are we trying to actually arrive at decisions that are actually tailored to the needs of the people in our community? What is actually driving the situation? And I see Kieran Donnelly, actually, the head of the NIO behind. It's all right dealing with the process and working with the process. But if you don't reach an outcome that is beneficial for the people within your jurisdiction, the process is wrong, in my opinion. We are actually trying to use a process which is rigid, and we are trying to actually go towards outcomes that are more based, not necessarily skewed, but are based towards the needs of the people in our district. And that's what we are trying to do. You, you mentioned that um, in terms of the charter, there are nine councils that are signed up, compliant or whatever, but two aren't. What's the status with those two councils? So did you want to come in? Yeah. If, if that's okay, yeah. I'll put it through you. Yep. Um, what we've got is nine councils who have achieved the charter, mm -hmm. and 
four of those uh, councils have actually um, gone a stage further and have uh, achieved Charter Plus. And that is in, they're now in a cycle of maintaining those, those awards. It's a bit like investors and people, but for councillors. There are two councils who are a wee bit further um, behind on the process, but they're both actively engaged in working towards the Charter. Um, and we would anticipate that, those, that they'll re receive assessments. So, Ms. Smith, can I ask, what, 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 what enhancement does the Charter bring to, the, to a council when it is... Uh Signed up to it. it provides an intentional approach to elected member training and development. Um, now, it's, it's very much elected member led. Um, the elected members will be uh, materially involved in assessing their, their training needs, um, and um, they, um, it's, as I say, it, it helps them to develop um, as they go along. So, um, if a member uh, will have identified planning training as, as a particular need, I mean that will that will be a feature. Um, they will have. Um, individual um, training plans as well as, as kind of a more consistent approach across the councils um, and I think we, what we need to do is maybe take a more focused look at how councils are, councils, councillors are trained in relation to the planning committees because I think uh, what has the, the report has picked out is that there's variation between councils and I think we know we could do a, a bit of work and, and certainly we have consistency into that. If, right, so, with, so, so maybe the standardisation from NILGA isn't what it should be or could be? NILGA is providing what it can with the resources that it has. We've got, we've provided an Institute of Leadership Management accredited qualification on planning in particular. Mm -hmm. we've, as I said, as um, Councillor Irvine has, has articulated, and we also provide focused training on ethics and the code of conduct um, for elected members, and we provide a very substantive councillor's guide to each elected member, giving detail on planning and what's required in the planning process and what's required in, in, in uh, relation to ethics and, and, and conduct. Um, I think that um, some councils have been um, incredibly proactive in making training mandatory for the councils, councillors um, through the council decision th itself. Um, and I, what I would like to do is maybe take a look at what training is provided in each council for the planning committee and whether there's a common syllabus or not that has been developed by the planning officers because I'm just not at that, I'm not across the detail of that at the mm. moment. I mean I would point out that most members of this committee have served in local government and would would would, would have a, a, a sympathy um, though I never actually served in the planning committee but can, can I just ask in terms the two councils that are not yet at charter level who are they which councils are they? Um, it is, to the best of my knowledge, is Mid East Antrim and Causeway Coast and Glens. Okay, and can, can I just ask then, um, what role has Nilga played um, around your concerns that you've articulated today, making those concerns known to the department and to, to government? Um, if I can maybe take this, yep. Chair. Um, Nilga works very closely with the department um, and Councillor Corr, in his role as Chair of the Place Shaping and Infrastructure Network, will meet regularly with the Chief Planner as and the Chief Planner also would come to Nilga Executive Committee meetings to um, address issues with the planning system and um, to uh, work uh, in close collaboration with uh, local government as, as, as far as we can affect that. Um, we, Nilga was materially involved in working with the department and council officials in the design of the uh, system, um, which we acknowledge was, uh, isn't effective at the moment. It's, it's, it's dysfunctional and needs to be improved. We have also um, provided uh, responses to the department in relation to um, their consultations on planning policy, on um, the review of the implementation of the planning, system, or planning act, and have articulated the Many of the concerns, actually, that were articulated by the audit office in relation to this report, um, and which really does effectively um, state what the problems are. What we're concerned with now is trying to um, work with the department, work with councils, to uh, develop a plan to take things forward, to make a change, to get the legislation that we need, and to get um, uh, the sort of uh, the change to the system that's required. I think. Um I think you, Councillor Corr, in your opening remarks, talked about Nilgan not being represented on this on the, the planning forum. I certainly am hugely sympathetic to that point, and I think other members are as well. But it'll be for the overall report collectively from this committee when it's finalised as to whether the committee collectively takes that view. Uh, I think, in, in terms of the joint upness that this committee has asked for across all our reports, 
that would make that would make good sense. Um, can I ask, um, Councillor Evans, in terms of the, <clears throat> you made reference twice to the former ministerial planning forum. I think was that the term you used. Yeah. Uh, yes, that's correct. So, how does that former ministerial planning forum disagree with or d d d um, differ from the current planning forum? Well, part of it is um, it's really officer to officer. Whereas you've indirectly sort of uh, questioned me with regard to what the committee does. The, the decision makers now at uh, local government level are councillors. We, we, we decide. What we delegate actually for the officers to decide is under delegated power. So essentially we still are, are the, 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 the decision makers. At the moment we haven't got a voice to actually express our concerns around the current legislation. Um, the problems that it presents. You, you've highlighted, actually, if I go back to a previous question, about the logjam in the system. I, I would probably uh, take you back and get you a look at the statistics. Yes, a lot of committees do call in decisions, but under the scheme of delegation, the majority of the applications are dealt with by officers, and they're dealt with under that delegated um, scheme uh, with regard to responsibility and turnout. Where it differs in each of the councils is the ability uh, to call in. So we're at the cliff face and at the quarry face, yet we don't actually have a voice at this level, at ministerial level, to actually express our concerns and express basically our experience to date after six and a half years. And whilst our officers are doing as good a job as they can, because they aren't the decision makers in this system, um, we feel we have been left out in the cold and we feel we need a voice so that you as the decision makers at a higher level can actually talk and interact with us and decide. And I, I'm not disparaging the work of officers at any level, but you understand uh, what we do. We want you then to understand the frustrations we have so you can carry that back. And you would refer to your previous experience in local government, but that was obviously prior to mm. the de devolution of these powers. Yeah. So we just want to talk on a, on a level with you as well. Okay. Thank you. So has Nilka asked for a place in this forum? Sure, if, if I could maybe come in on that. Um, I, I'm not sure that it would be appropriate for Nilga to have a place on the planning forum. Um, I don't think, uh, and actually, I mean, from discussions with our planning officers, I'm not sure that there is... Um, a kind of overall local government satisfaction with the, the, the input into the planning um, forum, even at officer level. What has happened is the planning forum was set up as a result of the Irvine report um, in relation to the, um, the performance of statutory consultees. Um, and that it was nearly set up to, to deal with that particular issue. So uh, from, from talking to our officers, what can happen at the planning forum? It's largely a conversation between civil servants about how departments are relating with each other. Um, and it is more operational. Um, I think that what our, our officers particularly would quite like is to take the idea of a forum, um, not necessarily the planning forum as it stands at the moment, and to develop that uh, and maybe as a commission or uh, under another title to really br bring the whole system together, bring all the players in the system together to improve the system, to work out okay. how to take it so, forward. So and the, the ministerial forum was more of the political discussion, the political um, right. vote on to so, that. So Nilga's position, just so I'm absolutely clear, would be to, to scrap the planning um, forum and set up this um, regional planning commission, which would include representatives in Nilga. Um, would include certainly would include local government officers, um, and it would but, be. But, for but, but to be honest, I'm I'm trying to assist yes, elected members. We, we I mean. One of the things that Alice McCullough made the point last week to to us, and we are hugely sympathetic, as I said, as politicians and former many of us former local government councillors, we are sympathetic to your issue. Mm -hmm. Why are you not wanting reps on on this this planning commission? I suppose um, that there is a kind of uh, a split between the operational and the political, um, and it's it's uh, uh, what what the way it was initially set up was that there was that, that political meeting. Group and that was that was very effective in in having that uh, discussion with the minister and the, the planning committee chairs. I mean, certainly um, there would be room for uh, an elected member to go on to whatever the replacement to the planning forum would be. But 
in saying that, it would uh, depend on what the terms of reference for that group were, and also what what it was, um, uh, what the outcomes that it hopes to achieve would be. So, uh, you know, and, and whether or not it would, whether or not an elected member would uh, be able to materially add value to that conversation, or whether or not it would be better to have the, the elected member conversations following on and building on the, uh, the officer conversations. Similarly, for example, the political partnership panel is a meeting between um, local government members, one from each council, and the executive ministers, and that is a political discussion. That is um, supported by a meeting between the permanent secretaries and the chief executives of the council. So we would see that that, that mechanism where you have um, operational discussions and political discussions in two separate yeah. um, See, we're, we're, we're not the infrastructure committee, and I don't want to stress, stray into because apart no, from no. we get half or most of this <laughs> committee is the infrastructure committee. <laughs> <laughs> um, I have no but, but, faces, but, yeah. but, but, but in, term, in terms of, in terms of the thing, I, I, I just think given the, the reputational problem that there is with planning in Northern Ireland, the perceptional problem, whatever way you want to call it, uh, and the fact that I've very identified with the permanent secretary at previous meetings fortnight ago today. That we have we have companies in Northern Ireland decided to relocate elsewhere in the UK because of planning, such as their frustrations. We need to be um, imaginative here to get these problems addressed, because what is clearly the issue is there was a problem before RPA. That problem is now bigger, so we need to be imaginative in how we we, we address those issues. And finally, for me, and then I'll have my wish. In terms of the, um, am I right in saying? Councillors have declared interests uh, uh, around planning committees, yes? Yeah. Uh, do planners have to declare interests? Uh, yes. They do? They do, yeah. Just the same, sorry, uh, I'll ride over Stephen, he, he can come back. Just the same as we have to declare interests if it's a relative or a financial interest. So um, um, an officer must have to declare if it's an application pertaining to himself or a close relative. In our case, under our scheme of delegation, if that declaration is made as the application has been processed, that application comes before the committee for decision rather than being streamed under the scheme of delegation. So, so we have that sort of um, fallback in place. Okay. So are you confident and you content that the reg register of interests for planners is as robust as that for councillors? At the moment, yes. I'm happy enough with it. I'm not sure what okay. Councillor Corr will say. I, to to I, I would concur, but I'm yep. just not too sure it's as robust because I don't, I, I, I'm just not aware of, of what, how robust it is. You know, I, I do know from an elected member how we work, if you know what I mean, but I don't know. Uh, we work being Belfast City Council. Yep, yep. Our elected members. So it may not be the case across the councils. Well, I imagine the declarations of interest are the same across all 11 council areas, but, you know, it, it, I, I do imagine, I do, but they're saying kind of like if, they're if all would, the same. If it would be helpful to the committee, I can um, do a bit of research on that and come back to you with yeah. um, For what uniformity. the answer to that question is, because it, it, it's just not something we have access to. Yeah, anymore. because it, in your previous answer about the Charter, I'm not sure that they will be, and, yeah. and clarity around that would, would be useful. Thank you. Um, Mr Muir. Thank you very much, Chair, and thanks for coming along. It's appreciated. Um, and it adds to the evidence we've had previously from um, the department and also from Solis, so I understand the context we're in. Um, just talking about the issue about overturns and stuff like that, um, we understand a significant number of those overturns have been in relation to developments within the countryside. Um, the argument <coughs> sorry, would be that those overturns are contrary to uh, policy, planning policy, um, which I, I understand the points you've outlined that that's been inherited. But the officer recommendations are in line with policy, and then the overturns are then contrary to that. Is it the case then that that policy is being set aside in these cases? Well, that, that question will fall to me. I don't think <laughs> I don't think Stephen has that many um, single dwellings in the countryside. Look, the, the SPPS is in place, and probably the policy that is most pertinent in the countryside is PPS twenty one. It used to be PPS 14, and I see Cahill, probably Melissa, and Roy will be nodding their heads because a lot of people would be um, coming to them, knocking on their door. We, we don't set policy aside. Um, my first thing would be, 
If you want actually to see uh, a committee in operation, go onto YouTube because with the COVID-19 pandemic and the way we've all been working virtually, we're, all councils have actually gone on to live streaming. So you can actually go in and sit down and see. I'll talk from experience and from Ananoma District Council. From the ruling in the, the High Court in regard to the, uh, I think it was the Lisburn and Castlereagh, um, a decision about two years ago where a judge made the ruling that um, any deviation from an officer recommendation needs to be substantively backed up by evidence, both written and oral. In other words, you need to see evidence of how, why, and under what regime uh, the committee members are actually overturning a recommendation coming in from uh, an officer. And that basically is to provide substantive evidence. Even before that ruling, we as uh, a council had taken the view that when an officer makes a recommendation for refusal, it's coming forward with a list of points for refusal. That we as a committee, during our deliberations, and I'll use the word interrogation of our officers on a friendly basis, in regard to the reasons why they have arrived at this decision and what they have or have not counted as material, um, we then actually will talk through and we will come individually and collectively towards an agreed position in regard to the reasons for overturn. And the member proposing and the member seconding on, in the committee have to, and that's through the chair's um, direction, actually come up with substantive planning reasons for overturning uh, refusal items. What you'll find, gentlemen and ladies, is that a lot of the recommendations for refusals under certain of the policies, particularly under PPS 21, say <coughs> CTY 4 or CTY 7, CTY 8, are interlinked. So you could have five items for refusal, but if you overturn, say, refusal item number one, two and three could actually fall because they're interlinked and interdependent. So if you overcome item refusal item one, you'll drop off two and three. You then have to go to four and five to actually say why you're doing it. And what that means is it's focusing the mind of the committee members in regard to what they and collectively the body considers material and the weight that they will give it in regard to what the officer is actually recommending and what they consider is weight and they will decide then what is going, going on. So, some of the issues, and you may not always be familiar, are particularly gap sites. Um, <laughs> see, Carl, you're, you're smiling, you, you know the word. And it's the interpretation under the policy as to what constitutes a building and what constitutes a gap that actually two additional dwellings can be put into without creating a ribbon of development. And I'm sorry for going down to that level of technicality, but that's what we as members actually have to deal with and that's what we have to interpret. And our officers will come in with um, their deliberation and their interpretation of what is their outcome with regard to their determination. And I emphasize the word, it's interpretation, because in the policy and the guidance notes lying underneath the policy, which the officers use as their daily framework to actually carry out the work, it doesn't say to them, you have to have a gap site with 110 meters width that will allow you to put two dwellings in that have the same frontage as the other two dwellings or properties either side of it. The size could be 80 metres, it could be 70 metres. It is all dependent on the circumstances surrounding each individual application and the circumstances pertaining to that application. And that's why we as a committee always set aside, and when I was chair, I always saw when I, I got call in applications from members who actually want to decide on uh, an application that was on the um, list, the, the delegated list, but we had to decide it as committee. When I saw the number of applications, they said, right, call in items, right, I'm going to allow 40 minutes. 
30 to 40 minutes for each application, and somebody would say, why? That is to give enough time for members to actually hear the presentation from the officers, to hear any representations from the agent and the applicant, to hear any representations maybe from objectors, then to hear the officer's rebuttal with regard to the um, evidence or the speech provided by the applicant and agents, and then for our own deliberation as a committee to actually then say, why are you doing this? Why are you doing that? I believe that that is okay, or we could get one dwelling or two dwellings in, and we come to that. And eventually you come to a level where materiality is down to proper interpretation and application of the policy aligned with the guidelines. Okay, thank and you. everything is done. I'm sorry I've taken so long, we, but we, it's so technical. We, just, we have a huge agenda today. We are, our mandate is running out, so could, if I can ask for brevity and answers, please, Mr Mayor. Thank you, and I will come on to the local development plan process because that's one of the issues about the policies. But some planning committees are uh, meeting potentially for days to consider decisions, some for hours. So there's a clear disparity in terms of how planning committees are operating. Is there an understanding of why that's the case? Across 11 different councillors? Yes. But some are meeting for days and end. Yes. Some are getting their business done in an evening. I, again, I, I don't know. I don't want to speak on behalf of the other ten councils, but I, 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 I can maybe come in and because it, 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 I mean, certainly, um, what I think Robert was trying to get across was the subjectivity of council or, or mm. of, of um, oh. planning applications and planning uh, situations. The, the variety of planning applications that councils receive is considerable. I mean, even if you, if we, we talk about major applications, that can range from a plan a couple of plan fields with a um, port of cabins on it to 49 houses and you know that's a huge disparity so different applications will take different lengths of time and it will be it will de be dependent on the council area what kind of applications that they um, receive and, and that will vary um, and on different different meetings um, so I mean there may be um, some councils that tend to take longer um, for, for meetings, but it'll depend on what, what type of applications they're receiving. Stephen, how long does your council meetings usually go on for? Well, they don't go on for days, an hour, a few hours, most, and then and I think it's, there's, there's, a, there's a, uh, always a, a ruse for you know, site visits for anything to be a bit more controversial, but they're, they're a lot quicker. Um, and the, the delegated authority that, that, that Robert has outlined about, you know, delegated authority from officers, Tends to keep the actual the plan applications come before before committee to to a minimum. I think it's the issue for me because Belfast would be seen as the largest local authority. Yeah. You have a situation there where others um, have more significant member involvement yeah. and intervention in relation to the applications. Yeah. One of the questions is in relation to the call in of applications from the delegated authority. So elected representatives on the planning committee can call in the application for consideration. Is there ever any understanding given to the committee? why that councillor decided to call that in because there must have been reasons for them to decide to call that uh, application in is that detailed to the committee or is the committee told and is it recorded whether that member was contacted by objectors and applicants what conversations were had to ensure that that application was called in just in the spirit of transparency and how that actually managed to come about I can just to speak from a Belfast point of view. I do know that the, the declarations of interest at, at, at the offset of any meeting or even in advance of it would, 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 would clear that to an extent. Where, where if there had been any, you know, lobbying or anything, it would be it would be declared, and, and that that's one of the. It's very clear. I, but again, I can't speak across the different eleven council areas. I'm not too sure what it was like in a. Councillor, I'd be able to answer that a bit more effectively. Uh, we're not told um, the reason as a committee why another member has called it in. I, I would like to um, dispute the fact that we're lobbied actually to call in anything on um, the list. We're not uh, personally, and I know my other fellow members, if anybody approaches us in that regard, sorry, can't talk to you. So in that case, yeah, was it, sorry, what, what, it does happen. It does happen, but it shouldn't happen, right. Chair. Yeah, I, I know, but this is... One of the reasons why this committee wants that is because we are aware of the of the issues. We we are all constituency representatives as well, so we know it does happen. And that's the issue that he's raising. Yeah, because yep. the application is being called in, but there must have been a motivator for that to occur. You know, and, and, unless the person went and did their own, their own personal investigations in relation to that application. Well, that contact. To the, the per, personally, we're given a list 
We have two options for call-in. One is when uh, an original application is made. We are notified on a weekly basis. Um, we can choose to call it in at that stage, and that's before anything is done. The second trigger point for us in FODC is where there, an application on the delegated list is either for refusal or has a number of objecting, objections to it. Those are the trigger points, and we get that on a weekly basis. And we then, as individual committee members, have up to seven days to issue a call-in notice to our officials, that's us, without actually anybody coming lobbying us. Uh, we have developed that trait that we scan the list. If we see an anomaly in it, it's up to us personally to actually go and interact. We don't take any lobbying from others, and I can only say that personally, but I know it's the experience of the majority of my committee. One last question, because a lot of people have probably covered the local development plan process, but the Heartland's decision whereby the, uh, the decision of the planning committee can then be called in by wider members of council beyond the planning committee, um, obviously that judgment has been made and there is need for update in terms of legislation. Does members have an understanding of whereabouts that is? Because I know that that's had an implication upon planning If I, if I can maybe come in on that, certainly um, uh, Nilga has uh, been speaking to DFI and to DFC. In relation to this, because obviously there's an aspect of that judgment that bears, uh, has bearing on standing orders regulations, which we're still waiting on. Um, unfortunately, because of uh, the stage we're at um, with this assembly mandate, um, we can't pr progress any new legislation at the moment. So it's going to have to wait until the next mandate. But it sort of it, it brings to bear the urgency that we face now in relation to planning legislation. Um, so we need we need that that Heartlands case um, legislation sorted out. We need, uh, I mean, certainly we talked about last week about validation checklists and things like that. There's really discrete pieces of legislation that can be brought to bear very quickly in the next mandate with political will um, to start improving that process. Fairly, fairly the short term things that could be done, short term fixes. I understand that, that legislation to update those standards has been waiting for quite a while. It would be useful if you could maybe write to us to give us a bit more details around that. That adds to the other issues that you have been waiting for. Yes, I think sir. it's important that that is noted. Fair enough. Okay. Yeah. Thank you, Mr Beggs. Again, thanks for your evidence to date. Um, but it, it does appear there is a major problem with the planning system. It, it's, a, it's almost a perfect storm of uh, inefficiencies and the lack of resources. Um, so in, in terms of methods of improving it, we, we've learnt that... Um, one of the difficulties has been uh, the absence of key supporting documents, and that then elongates the whole process. And I would then assume that officers would have to reread material once it comes in and refresh and go and chase documents and, and, and add to their administrative burden. So, so my, my question is, we've been advised that Belfast City Council has been deemed to have adopted good practice. Why has that not been adopted elsewhere? Through, through you, um, I think um, it was articulated um, quite well last week um, that uh, Alison McCulloch, is, who's the chief, exec uh, chief executive of Fermanagh um, District Council, um, I think that they attempted to bring in a validation checklist similar to Belfast City Council, but the local um, applicants and agents um, stood out against that. Now, it is a voluntary system in Belfast, so it's something that actually they needed to get buy-in from the whole system in the Belfast City Council area to um, be able to do. It's not mandatory. Um, and, I mean, certainly our planning officers very, very strongly would, would seek legislation urgently in relation to that so that that can be spread out through the, the 11 council areas. But there are... There are um, issues in relation to quality of applications that we see right across the councils, and it would be very, very helpful to, I mean, to address that failure demand that Kate Bentley was talking about last week, um, and to sort of get rid of the whole part of the process that takes away from um, planning activity. I, I can see why um, councils would wish for it to be mandatory, um, but it is working in Belfast until such legislation would come. What's, what has been the experience of, of operating this voluntary system? So I, I'll take that mixed. Uh, again, it depends a lot. Um, I think, as Karen's alluded to, a lot of the agents actually have taken it on board, and they're actually uh, front-loading their applications. In other words, giving enough documentation that the officers can adequately um, scrutinise and determine the application. There are some agents who are still 
putting in a skeleton uh, of material with an application in a wing and a prayer and hoping that it'll go through. I, I don't know why. It's possibly because they don't want to spend the money or they don't want the applicant to incur additional cost in regard to further reports and everything like that. But um, we're doing what we can. But again, because it's not mandatory, it's a case of trying to encourage uh, people as much as possible. My understanding is the experience of Belfast is it has worked and that uh, most agents have followed it. So why do other councils not try to at least adopt the voluntary system? Admittedly, some people may refuse to comply with it, but the majority might. Why, 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 why do you not adopt that good practice? Um, well, sure. Sorry, go ahead. It, look, you, you're talking about uh, 11 autonomous units. Two of them so far have tried to put in a discretionary um, system. It's working far better in Belfast. It's working to a reasonable extent with ourselves, and I would tie it back to the amount of applications coming in that get determined uh, for approval. There is a tie back there as well. Um, we sort of sit in the top quartile with regard to that, but it does cause referrals, referrals, referrals. <coughs> which is eating up our time, Roy. Thanks. In, in terms of then the, the, the pressures on, ultimately the rate payers are paying for this, it's not, not the applications. Uh, um, the level of fees has only increased by 2% since they originally sat in, in 2015. Why has there not been uh, a review? Are you, have councils sought a review so that they would more reflect the, the inflationary pressures or other pressures in the planning um. system? you, Chair, yes, um, Nilga has um, uh, written to the Department, has responded to consultations from the Department on plan planning fees, saying that we need to have a complete review of planning fees that, rather than, uh, than inflationary uplift, um, because they need to be contemporised. We've given them figures. We responded with, to the, the um, re review um, into the implementation of the Planning Act and, and, and gave them figures in relation to um, planning fees elsewhere. Um, and I think that um, that is, as I say, it's one of those quick fixes that if we got um, the, the sort of buy-in from the Assembly to get the legislation through as an urgent economic matter for Northern Ireland, um, that, I mean, they, we could make improvements very, very quickly if we had the right legislation in place. Um, just coming back to, to your former point, there's another issue in relation to those um, unsatisfactory applications in that agents are acting on behalf of applicants. And there is an issue in relation to understanding of the planning system within the public um, and how it works and what they should be expecting. Because, I mean, if you're paying for a service, you should be expecting good service. And people are clearly not getting a good service in some areas. Um, I have been involved in working with the department um, in relation to uh, the, ministeri the minister's um, investigation into engagement in the planning process to try to improve that and how to um, increase community understanding of what is required. But I think there's a, there's a piece there in relation to that as well as the, the validation checklists from the, the council perspective. The other area of burden of cost that has failed, failed to rate pairs to pick up is the uh, additional unseen cost of area the planning process, mm. the development plans, which are taking much, much longer than originally envisaged. What uh, does Nilgan Council see as, as being a contributory factor to that and what can be done to improve it? Sorry, Chair, I don't think you have enough time left in the <laughs> session to actually go through it, but I'll try and be concise. Uh, the department uh, in the, the transfer said it would take four years, uh, indirectly. Uh, the problem is there are only two councils currently at independent <coughs> examination stage. Belfast has gone through it. We're the second one currently going through it. Um, the issue is the process that's involved takes so much consultation, evidence gathering, collating, going out, agreeing, moving forward, that the time scale has just elongated out. I doubt if any area of local development plan will be in operation before a time span of about nine or ten years. And the unfortunate thing is it's the process that's slowing the whole thing down and the amount of evidence that you actually have to provide to substantiate 
that your local development plan is sound, and soundness was a new concept brought in under the 2014 legislation and is being currently enacted by the 11 councils. I understand we adopted, was it the Welsh model, or I think it was the Welsh model. Uh, are they doing something different that we're doing, or, or are they, did they also take nine or ten years? Chair, if I can maybe come in. I, mean, I think that there have been checks and balances that have been added into the process in Northern Ireland, and I think part of that stems back to the lack of confidence in councils actually taking the function on right at the start. And we're still in that kind of space, whereas we should have moved on, and there has been a difficulty in moving on because of the, the, the firstly, the, the lack of, of an assembly for a number of years and then COVID. Um, but certainly there are things like um, the, the building in of re reference to the department as an interim body between the Council and the Plan, uh, the Plan Appeals Commission, that that doesn't happen elsewhere. So we, we, it bounces to the, the Plan, bounces to the Department, then to the PAC, then back to the Department, then back to Councils. And I think Kate was very um, vociferous about it last week, and that she said uh, that adds an, a year into the process. That doesn't happen elsewhere. Um, we have a fragmented public sector in Northern Ireland. We've got statutory consultees where the, um, those functions are within Councils elsewhere. Um, and I think that the failure to transfer the place shaping functions that, to support planning to councils um, in uh, 2015, I think that's been to the detriment of the Northern Ireland economy. And I think that's something that has to be looked at very closely, um, very soon into the, the next mandate of the Assembly. And it'll that, to my mind, is, is wider than DFI. It'll take in a number of d different government departments um, to try to see if we can continue to normalise local government in Northern Ireland to be the same as it should be elsewhere, or that it is elsewhere. Um, based on the research that the RPA and I team did way back when, that information hasn't changed. You know, the, the reasoning behind what they recommended hasn't changed. Normal local government has place shaping functions beyond planning that support the process. We don't, and that's part of the delay in the whole thing. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Mr McHugh. Good morning, Mr. Chair. <coughs> this five year old legs are all very welcome. It's nice meeting with some of you again that I haven't seen for a number of years now. Uh, and Robert, you don't mind me coming back to you again just uh, in relation to uh, planning applications and uh, overturning uh, applications. Uh, because in the Fermanagh Noma Council area in particular, you know, they have a fairly uh, high rate there of uh, overturn of recommendations by the planners, and they accept. Uh, <coughs> interpretation and as much as that uh, you arrive at decisions based on local conditions and the likes of it and also a line that that was included just in your presentation you said that when one would identify a plan and matter um, that is relevant to an application then <coughs> it is with the councillor to weight that at whatever weight he wishes to weight it and that in itself can have a major influence on arriving at a decision. Now, uh, do you think is that the reason why does this Fermanagh uh, and Oma in particular you know, have a much higher rate of overturn than other areas? I, I, Melissa, uh, I could probably give in to your, your uh, sentiment there, but I, I would say that, um, obviously I'm going to be biased, that Fermanagh and Oma District Council are more concerned with regard to uh, the countryside. We feel that it's our duty and uh, our ability and within our remit actually to call in and question uh, proposed uh, recommendations from officers and debate them actually. I would refer you, if you look on the one side at call in, look at the other side in regard to the processing of actually applications under the uh, devolved lift, the, the delegated list. We would sit as number one or two for actually turning around and approving the majority of applications coming through. So whilst it's one aspect of what we do, it's an important aspect and I wouldn't take it away from us. What I feel it shows, and I've said it before and I'll, I'll say it again, it shows the interest, the determination and the experience of council, uh, sorry, committee members as councillors, that they consider that they have the relevant knowledge and ability to interrogate and interpret the policies and actually challenge 
in a, not an adversarial way, but a proper way, the recommendations coming before uh, from officers. And it also shows, to be fair, that we just don't rubber stamp decisions going forward. We are prepared to put our head above the parapet, look at recommendations, and should we decide that we have material issues that haven't been given, in our opinion, enough weight or interrogated properly, then we will make that decision and we will then note it and decide. And probably what that would require as well, too, is a, a certain degree of expertise on the part of the councillors. Do you feel that uh, adequate provision uh, is made currently in order to develop and train councillors uh, in improving their efficiency in arriving at those decisions? Yep. We, we encourage, as a council, um, members to actually avail of NILGIS training on the ILM course, of which I did, those to go forward and get mentored, but we also provide in-house training um, where it's a, a mandatory requirement that anybody uh, nominated to sit on the planning committee must attend in-house training as well as attached training before they can actually sit and take part in the decision-making process within the committee. And we do that. We get regular updates too on a yearly basis with regard to refresher training. We also mentor each other so that if I have a new member coming in from my party, I will take them aside. I won't try and influence them. I'll try and encourage them to listen, to look at, to interrogate, and do some background reading. And that's what they do. And Stephen, uh, I know in your presentation you had actually mentioned as well too uh, about the revision and the updating of the Code of Conduct. Um, do you have any uh, suggestions for what should be included in that uh, revision? Jeez. I, I suppose it's, it's the revision would need to be moving with times and moving, moving with the it, there's a bit of a discussion about the, the slow nature of the local development plans and, and community plans which are being developed by the councillors. So the, 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 the update and training would have to be relevant to that because a community plan, for example, in, in the city of Belfast, it's currently up for, out for review. It's, it's under review now. It'll change, and it'll change in line also. The local development plan ha hasn't been hasn't been totally, you know, formalised yet. So new ways of working, new new ways of um, uh, work, working across the city or work, working right across all different councillors should um, dictate and necessitate the difference and changes of of, of, of training um, to, to suit whatever new uh, legislation is coming coming come our way. Do you feel that within it, at the present time, that it's robust enough in order to ensure that there isn't an abuse uh, of practice, we'll say, by councillors and uh, other? Definitely. Yeah. Do you De think that? Definitely. Definitely so, yeah. Sorry, through you, Chair. If I can maybe just come in on that. Um, the, 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 the Code of Conduct is extremely robust, possibly too robust in some areas, to the point where, at the minute, the way it's written, every single councillor in Northern Ireland has broken it. Every single one, because of the way it's written, because it, it sort of it, it actually is written in a way that uh, interferes with normal council working and, and sort of the inter-party relationships, the, the party discussions that happen. Not necessarily planning is a different thing. There's a, there's a separate aspect of the code of conduct in relation to planning, which is absolutely valid and absolutely necessary. It's actually the rest of the code of conduct that we're, we're, we desperately have been seeking a review of since it was written um, and put into place, um, and we have been waiting on that since 2016. Um, and have been lobbying consistently for that review, and have been. But it's again, it's a different um, department. It's DFC rather than, than DFI in relation to that. Well, just what I'm actually alluding, alluding to here uh, is corruption. And you know that when you think of it, you know that whether one's talking about, we'll say, an individual uh, wishing to build a house or a major type uh, plan project, maybe uh, by developers and the likes of it as well too, just to keep the facility maybe that might exist for. Corruption and what way are, are, are you prepared for that? Um, Chair, if I can uh, go, go through uh, through you, um, I think um, Mr. McKee, I went through the local government commissioner for standards website um, a couple of days ago in preparation for this meeting, and the perception is not the reality. Um, if there was a problem, there would be many, many more complaints in relation to planning, and there aren't. Um, I think that um, there there was a suspicion of councillors being involved in the planning process uh, from word go because, oh, it's councillors, it's politicians, of course they're going to be corrupt. You know? And it, I think it, there, there is a, 
uh, a perception of elected members, politicians or right across the board, MPs, MLAs, councillors, and where you, what your motivations are. And I think that it's unfair uh, on councillors to um, have those allegations of corruption where the evidence shows that that is not borne out. I mean, you're talking about three people in, what, since 2015 haven't been um, censured, maybe. So it's, it's not... Um, the, the facts aren't there to support that view. I, I would agree with you, and uh, it's just to ensure that we do have in place uh, all of those systems that ensure that it continues at that level as well, too. Good morning. Thank you. Mr Irwin. Mr Irwin, you need to... Uh, I'm just getting unmuted there. Thank you, Mr Chairman, and thank you for your presentation. Uh, plan, in my eyes, is bogged down in red tape. Uh, too much consultation. Uh, one, I'll give you one quick instance. Uh, Bungalow Pass in the countryside in October, uh, the young that got their free will felt it was too large and he, he would reduce the size because it was too expensive for him. Reduced it, put in an application in December to reduce the size. All those consultations that were consulted two months or three previous all had been consulted on, on a, an issue where a house is already approved, but we're looking at a smaller house on the site. So all I think was I know there was a nurse involved in this particular one. There's a number of uh, all the all the consultees had to be reconsulted in this particular one. So even planners themselves feel that they're bogged down in this. Uh, do you feel there's any one thing or two things you could say would help uh, get or say get the planning system out of the crisis is currently in at the moment? Chair, if I can maybe take that, certainly we've, we've had, particularly in relation to the consultees, in the short term, it's going to be different. We'll need a legislative change uh, in relation to um, the change in that statutory consultee input. Um, and I mean, it's my mind that a lot of that uh, con statutory consultee work um, could be brought in-house with councils, as it is in other places. Now, to do that in the short term, we'll need a bit of innovative thinking, as the Chair was talking about earlier on. There may be means of uh, seconding um, statutory consultees into councils. Obviously, there's a cost implication to all of this, and we need to make sure that the costs of, of all this are covered. I, I think that, um, in addition, we've, we've been talking about the skills deficit um, within um, planners and, and, and planning um, within the councils, but also um, I think that members need to be aware of the fact that um, the Statutory consultees have been experiencing voluntary redundancy <coughs> and a skills deficit and a staff deficit as well. Um, so making sure that, I suppose, coming from 2015, whenever I think we were ill-prepared to take on 12 planning authorities, the, the statutory consultees were ill-prepared to take on 12 um, planning authorities, I think that we, we still are, are playing catch-up and there's still a need to staff up. Um, but I think that there's, there's some merit in having to think about how to... Um, bring that statutory consultee um, function in house, but I do agree with you. Um, there's a lot of red tape, and it's, it's a lot of there's a lot of delays. What one thing I have asked the chief planner to do is to provide an illegal with information and actually provide the public with information on the breakdown per council area of the statutory consultee times. What we've got is an overarching, you know, percentage of, of statutory consultee responses done within the, the, the necessary time period. But we've no figures per individual council, so we can't see where there are particular issues with particular statutory consultees in particular places. And I think we need to have a <coughs> really take a deep dive into that information and to make sure that we know where the, the, the key problems are happening. Uh, I, I'm aware that in some situations, consultees don't don't come back for months on end. I know one particular one I was dealing with, uh, their due their own due time back was the first of July and in November they still weren't back. So, you know, there is a job of work to be done to deal with that. Absolutely. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. Um, just so that you're aware, in case you think there's ongoing fire alarms. Uh, the, 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 the bill is the division bill, so the House is sitting today. Normally we don't have the House sitting on Thursdays, but it's sitting today because of the tragic circumstances uh, with Mr Stalford uh, earlier in the week. Uh, can I just ask, in relation to um, the point that's been made about autonomous organisations, um, in terms of your own minister, the, the, the Minister for Communities is the local government minister. 
Uh, and, and in terms of your concerns and whatever, have you, I mean, have, has Nilga made representations to the Minister? Um, Chair, through you, um, the yes, um, repeatedly um, since 2016 to get the legislation through that we mm. need to finish off the Local Government Act 2014 and uh, the secondary legislation. I know that, well, no, no I'm, I'm told that there have been two attempts to get the standing orders regulations through, for example, through the Assembly, but that there's been a, a political issue in relation to that particular piece of legislation that we need the Assembly to get sorted out. We can't, we can't do it. And what is that issue, if I may ask you? It's the quality, qualified majority vote issue, Colin, mm. in relation to that. And that, that brings back the, the Heartlands case that, that Mr Muir was talking about earlier on, and that, that's all tied in. We need um, the DFC to modernise the code or revise the code of conduct. The work has been done, it just hasn't got through the Assembly. And we're, I think because there's been so much has happened in this mandate because of, of, of we're getting the new DNA document and then COVID kicking in, the necessary legislation that local government needs has kind of gone to the back foot a wee bit. And I mean, that's understandable, but now we're seeing the economic impact of that and we need to get it sorted out pronto. Mm -hmm. Mr Borland, did you wish to come in? Yeah, thank you, Chair, and thank you very much. You're very welcome. And it's a breath of fresh air here and some of the, the issues again. I've dealt with for a number of years, Chair, but I, 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 do, I do agree. I mean, and Chair, it was a good explanation for Councillor Irvine there in terms of subjectivity and interpretation in terms of plan. It was interesting to hear Mr Muir's question. I mean, the Council's there to make decisions. You've trained up now to make decisions just because there comes a recommendation in terms of the policy. It's open to interpretation. And my, my, only, my only issue with it is, whilst I agree with the autonomy and to make your own decisions, in terms of rural decisions, right across the board, it's not the same because it's similar areas. So ABC being the, one of the, the biggest rural council, there's decisions made over, and, and good luck to those people who get that decision in terms of rural and per se. Um, there should be a consistency across the board. But it's down to interpretation. But maybe. But I just want to start off because see, we need to go back. And Karen, I appreciate the assembly was down and all for a while. But I was here at the time we we done the workforce model, and we were assured it was right. And now, and I asked this question last week. Clearly, it wasn't. Is that a fair assumption? I mean, and what discussions have you had? Because my next question, I think Mr. Beggs might have asked it. Because how we go to address it then is going to be through these. I mean, if we need the resource to deal with, and that's going to be an issue for yourselves and collectively us all. I mean, because we're either going to go to fees or go to the department, looking at funding to, to or secure funding. So the, the point, the, the whole thing about the workforce model and how we go forward in delivering the model and, and delivering, would anybody like to discuss that, Art? Well, look, <laughs> when the resource was transferred, that's both human resource and financial. Um, it wasn't totally adequate, either of them. We take on board, I think, as individual councillors, yes, um, as demand spikes up and down, you're going to have to tailor your workforce resource to that. But the problem about finances was we, we were led to believe on the transfer of functions in 2015, collectively, that it would be rates neutral. It, it's not rates neutral at the moment. Uh, the issues with regard to development decisions, which is really processing applications, is not. That, that is demand-led, and at times the amount of work, you've all alluded to it as members, within applications has meant more officer time input to a substantial number of applications coming through all level and councils, which has a financial impact. The, the hidden cost, I think, and Mr Beggs actually referred to it as under the LDP, the processing time for the LDP has become phenomenal, and yet we as councils, each individual 11 council, has to try and absorb that cost. And it's not only in-house staff costs, that's officer cost, it's actually the resource that we have to draw in from outside, particularly on the legal and the specialist side, with regard to the amount of reports, specialist reports, that we've had to actually provide to substantiate the soundness of each of our draft plan strategies. So my answer back to you, Mr. Boyle, very quickly, Cahill, is we would like more money from the centre because indirectly within planning and in other functions that we have picked up over the last six or seven years, we have not got the necessary revenue resource. The capital resource, to be fair, 
is there and it can be drawn down, but the re revenue resource to back up what we have to do directly and indirectly isn't there. And the answer is, if you will give us more money, we will gladly take it and we will ensure or try our best to ensure the system becomes more streamlined with your help at the centre. Thank you. I have a couple of other points. In terms of the Belfast have a tick box exercise in terms of, I mean, is that being used across the board? Because we talked at the earlier part was front loading the system, but I've seen you're saying a bit more material considerations being given. It was mentioned last week, which is fair enough. That's part of the process. Yep. But in terms of the tick box exercise, about user find that, or is that going out through the board in terms of going right across the council? Or are you just considering that? As, as we're talking about the validation yeah, checklist yeah. again. Um, certainly, um, the, there is a, an aspiration to roll that out across the councils, but mo a lot of the councils are uh, seeking um, a, a legislative backup for, for asking for that. Um, so that because what uh, certainly the experience outside Belfast is that there's a kickback from a lot of the applicants and agents. Um, if, if I can just come back on your, your former point about um, funding or the, the finances and the, the, the workforce model. Mm -hmm. Workforce model, as we know, is, wasn't sufficient in terms of funding or actually the skills that were brought across, and particularly in relation to the local development plans, because you went from a, a system where that was developing one plan a year, one that was trying to develop 11 plans at once, so you didn't actually have as the necessary people you needed. Um, but another aspect of this is that there might be something in, in that the committee might want to consider in relation to how the statutory consultees are paid for. At the minute, there's no charge for statutory consultees, as far as I'm aware. So another option may be to introduce a separate charge for the statutory consultee services um, to, with, to, for, for the um, applicant to pay for, um, which would introduce, uh, as I say, may need further legislation. But that, that's something that maybe could be considered if we have to keep the statutory consultee system that we've got at the moment. Uh, just two quick points, and, and because I'm keen to get on to the real stuff. But say in terms of, uh, say in terms of the pod process. How can we better it in terms of trying to speed the process up in terms of the pre-application discussion? Well, I'll beat our drum here at FODC. We, we of the 11 councils are the one that use the pad the most, and we find it extremely difficult, sorry, pre-application discussion. Question, yes. uh, yep. Um, we find it extremely useful in that it has helped streamline then the agents applying on behalf of the applicants with regard to what information they need or what steer they need to go down the direction of travel so that they're policy compliant and it's proving worthwhile but again it takes up officer time but we have found that it's useful to do that at the start because it does free up time during the actual deliberation of an application and it helps the applicant actually to get a desired outcome that'll be a key element i mean if it is a key element definitely. yes just, just back to finally, because I know all the members have asked most questions. The SPPS and the PPS21, those who understand it, I mean, clearly there could be changes made to it as well, which would, would help out. Or is that a fair assumption? The fair assumption is probably the SPPS needs to be slightly altered now in regard to its approach after each of the councils have applied it and PPS 21 incorporated. But look, the LDPs are supposed to take cognizance awareness of the SPPS and the regional planning policies plus all the PPSs, but they need, each individual council should be tailoring their LDP within the uh, framework. You know, I, I appreciate it, but if we wait, we're going to have the same problems. You know, we, yeah. we can look at statutory consultees, the fees issue and all of that, you know, by the time we get around the LDPs, and I appreciate it, we, we've had it all before, the reason development plan and all those things, but it's playing a part in the holding up the whole system, that's the point. Yeah. Yeah, but I do appreciate it, and I'd like to see more consistency across the board. Yeah, I'd like to, because what's, what's relevant in rural Fermanagh is relevant in, in rural Armagh. And I mean, of course it is. And that's the point, and we talk about sustainable rural communities, and that's part and parcel of the problem, we've seen it here in the audit and some of the decision-making process. But I want, just want to make that point. Sorry, yeah, just, to, just to interject, um, just to urge a note of caution in relation to any sort of major changes to the SPPS at the moment, because of the stages that the, the uh, LDPs are at, um, I think that any major change could have un unintended consequences that wouldn't be desirable. So uh, if there's going to be any change to planning policy, that needs to be done in consultation, in partnership, co-designed with the councils, and not done to 
the council. No, Karen, and I will say this. If, <laughs> if, if all, sorry, last point, Chair. If all the local development plans are saying the housing units, that's our target, that's both urban and rural, I would agree with it, and, and then we won't have to change the policy. But, but as long as the LD, and, and unfortunately they're going to take a time, but I, we've all gone through the LDP process. We know as long as the housing units meets its targets, that's okay. But if it's not, then we have to look at policy. But, but thank you very much. Okay, thanks. One, one of the points that came up um, during our last and previous sessions was the skill shortage around mm -hmm. local government, with people going off, with RPA and people going to the early, the early scheme for people, public servants to take, take the money in the severance scheme. Um, how has that affected planning? Chair, Chair um, bearing in mind that the, the elected members are here. I mean, certainly, I, I, I think the point was made last week that we do have a good pool of people coming in. Um, it's just it's the experience that you lose, um, and that that's has sort of has, has happened yeah. over time. But it's not just in the councils. It's in <coughs> said earlier on. It's in the statutory council tea bodies as well. So um, if you've got some fresh face in, I don't know. The DFI Rivers um, trying to look at a planning application. It's it's having making sure that you've got the experience that you need to be able to process the thing quickly, um, and that that is it is a key issue. Um, I think that um, certainly we have been working with the department in relation to training on on major issues. Um, for example, the um, the environmental um, requirements that are in place now, and that really have ad added a layer of complication into planning. Um, the, the department were keen to make sure that um, staff were trained in those environmental issues, and NILGA actually um, made sure that elected members were offered training on that as mm. well. It's, um, a, it's a civil service I was talking about, but moving on now to local government, mm -hmm. um, are you convinced across, because you can, have, you can have a holistic overview of local government here, uh, are you convinced that the skill set is there with our 11 councils at the moment? Um, I think that there are certain skills that we're missing in certain areas. Um, I think, for example, and this is maybe more um, aesthetic than, than um, practical planning um, thing, but certainly whenever it comes to, to place making and, and public realm work, um, there's I think only Belfast has an urban designer. Um, so that kind of skill, that architecture skill, this sort of how things look and go together and fit together locally, um, that is, is a key skill that's maybe is missing. Now there are avenues to for, where councils can share services. I mean, we've got the shared environmental service um, running out of Mideny Stantrum. We have a shared um, uh, notice service um, in relation to um, house sales and so forth um, coming out of, I think, from Anna Noma took the, took the lead on that. Um, but um, the, the ability for councils to share service and buy in those skills and bring in those skills to have in-house, there's a cost application to that. And if we don't have the resource at the minute to that, to have the services as, as cost neutral to the rate pair. That's it's it's going to add further so, costs in. So the answer to that's no. no. Um, in terms of uh, Nilga, and in terms of the fact that we've heard that there are eleven autonomous councils, and some of them are urban and some of them are are um, rural, uh, some of them are unionist, some of them are nationalist. Um, some no control. Um, is there sufficiency uh, in terms of the standardising of practice um, coming from Nilga and teeth to ensure that the worst performing council can be brought up to the level of the best performing council and we get a standard practice? Because the, the, the point I've made in the last couple of weeks to, to both government and to to, to um, your colleagues from Solis was whenever ministers go out to sell Northern Ireland PLC and there's foreign direct investment sought to come here and then people are met with this planning problem you know John Lewis for example of, 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 of that investment being lost to Northern Ireland I'm not going to go into the issues around Lewis but that's just an example how can we get to the point that that standardisation is there? Um, Chair, I think that um, NILGA, as a, a representative body for local government, um, has been very good at sharing good practice, at providing training, at trying to improve the system by working directly with the department. 
uh, involved and, to, and with the um, heads of planning. We don't have an operational function. We don't have uh, a function whereby, it's actually, I think, in our constitution where we don't criticise individual councils. And we, when we deal with an issue, it's to try to raise the, raise the bar generally and work with everybody um, in the same, same thing. So it, it's not a function of ours to, to stand in criticism of, of council. I mean, certainly, the, I, mean, it, I think um, Kieran and his colleagues have done a good job in identifying where the problems are and actually identifying what the problems are, which we, we did know a lot of anyway, but it's good to see it down on paper from a, an outside organisation. Um, but certainly NILGA um, wouldn't be in a case of, of having like a league table of councils or anything like that. That's not what we do. OK. Um, well, I think all members here indicated they wanted to ask questions have... Ah, uh, Mr... Just a, one brief answer. question. mid Ulster decided not to go with the portal, and that was a decision by elected representatives. I'm interested to know your views and opinions in relation to that, because it's uh, now the odd one out, and statutory consultation, you're going to have to do everything twice. Again, we wouldn't be in the business of criticising individual <laughs> councils. <laughs> yeah, it's, you know, and, 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 no, to be fair to Middleston, you know that is the decision that their members have taken, and for for practical purposes. Um, so, um, I think that it, the, the proof will be in the pudding. We'll see how it works out for them. Okay, thank you. Um, uh, and, and I am definitively saying all members have asked their questions. Uh, and thank you all very much thank for you. your attendance today. I, I apologise for the lay of the room, and that members heads and whatever in the way of people giving evidence. I'm sorry about that, but uh, obviously we have to comply with the COVID regulations. So um, can I just ask if Mr. Donnelly or Mr. Stevenson have any questions they want to ask before we uh, uh, let our colleagues uh, go for the afternoon? Okay. Thank you very much. Mr. Donnelly, have you anything? No, no, I've nothing. Mr. Stevenson? Okay. Okay. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you. Thank, thank you. you sure. And I'll get back to you with those pieces Darn of information. Yeah. That we're okay, thanks. Before. Okay, members, we're now going to take a short um, adjournment to allow the room to be reset. Okay, thank you. Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30.